Ok. Bon, donc, merci à tout le monde pour être là à cette nouvelle édition du séminaire français d'optimisation. Donc, euh, séminaire en ligne qui continue environ une fois par semaine. Thomas. Donc, euh, euh, Sylvain, je vais te mettre muet tout de suite. <rire> Euh, donc je vais le faire juste après. Donc, euh, mm, on a le plaisir d'accueillir Luis Briseño Arias de l'Université Technique Federico Santa Maria au Chili, donc, qui nous fait nous le plaisir de nous faire cet exposé malgré le décalage horaire et qui va nous parler d'algorithmes de splitting pour l'optimisation convexe non lisse et en particulier avec des applications en jeu à champ moyen. Merci Luis. Bon, merci beaucoup Filippo. Je, voulais, je voudrais commencer pour quelques mots de remerciement aux organisateurs pour m'avoir invité à ce séminaire. Ce séminaire, c'est la première fois que je parle ici. Ce séminaire, pour moi, c'est très lié à une communauté que j'apprécie beaucoup, que c'est la communauté française d'optimisation, qui, en fait, bon, ils m'ont accueilli très chaleureusement en France pendant ma thèse, et jusqu'à présent, on a des liens très proches. Aussi, la même communauté a, a, a été très importante dans la formation de la plus partie de, des optimiseurs au Chili. Donc, euh, c'est très important pour nous. Donc, je suis ravi de pouvoir euh, faire un exposé ici avec vous, malgré la distance, euh, que c'est un des avantages de ce type de séminaire en ligne. Donc, euh, déjà, remercie aux organisateurs pour, pour l'invitation. Et donc, euh, bon, je... Euh, je vais changer en anglais juste en cas il y a quelqu'un qui arrive qui ne parle pas la, la langue, donc je, je vais préférer de, de faire l'exposé en, en anglais. As you possible. want. I will, I will change, switch to English. And this talk uh, is devoted to splitting algorithms for non-convex optimization, uh, so non-smooth convex optimization, uh, but for, more, uh, for some particular instances of uh, convex optimization who arises naturally, which arises naturally in mean field games. Then uh, this talk has three parts. The first part motivates what a mean field game is. Uh, the second part uh, and how the mean field game can be uh, put in the context of uh, convex optimization. After that, uh, I will present some uh, uh, splitting algorithms for solving that particular structure of problem. And, and there I, I will talk about a, um, some, a review of uh, starting from the basics of methods for solving uh, convex optimization problems. And uh, the, the, the last part of the, of the talk, I will try to apply and see how the, this algorithm adapts to the particular mutual games, uh, or the particular optimization problem arises from mutual games. And that's the idea of the problem. For the part linked to the splitting algorithms, I have to say that this work is a uh, joint work with a colleague in Chile, uh, Julio Deride, and two students, uh, Christian Vega and Sergio Lopez, in which we, de we derive some algorithms which uh, uh, profits uh, from the structure of this problem. And uh, with respect to mean field games, uh, uh, the results I will show are, are joint work with uh, Dante Calice of Nottingham University and Francisco Silva, which is also of the French Chilean community uh, in Limoges. Then uh, I, I will start with uh, uh, some uh, motivation. The idea of mean field games is uh, that it's to try to model a problem, um, a game with a very large number of players in which each game uh, chooses, in, we will set the, the, the point in the crowd, then each, uh, each, 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 uh, each player try to choose a location in some compact set. And uh, this location depends uh, for sure from his preference to be in a place, for instance, in a concert, will be, be near here from the stage. And, but uh, they have some aversion to people, then they try to be uh, somehow far from the others. Then his payment, his cost function, depends uh, of his own uh, strategy, let's say his own action, which is to choose a place, but also from the actions of the others. The, the, the place is uh, chosen, but the other people are important in, her, in his or her cost. Then that's an example. It's just a concert, uh, Michael Jackson concert in the Wembley uh, Stadium. And uh, you can see that when the number of players goes to infinity, you can see a kind of a density. You know, it's a, it's kind of a, a mass. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a density that, and that will try to explain or to model how the uh, people behave. That's, uh, that's the main idea. Here you have another, uh, another picture. 
in which this is a um, this is a demonstration in Chile in the la, in the last year, uh, and there all the people try to be close. Uh, their, their place to be is uh, around here, which is the Plaza Italia for the people who have been in Chile, in which uh, it's a monument there, and that's a very icon iconic uh, monument. And everyone wants to be there, but uh, again, uh, you have some places uh, around here that the density it's less. Uh, usually in demonstration, people uh, walk, then you have trajectories. But here we were trying to fix in the stationary version in which the people already arrived. And this demonstration was so crowded that the people actually finally are, uh, uh, was only we, uh, without any movement. They only choose a, a place and stay there. Then that's the stationary version that I will talk uh, just in some minutes. Then that's the main idea, and you can see also that you have a density, you have his, some boundaries <laughs> of the, and, on the density, and, uh, well, and you have the spread of the people, and you can see when the numbers of um, players go to infinity, here there was um, 1.2 million, then um, close to, not close to infinity, but uh, let's say too much, and uh, there you can see that you have a kind of a density. That's uh, the that's idea. Okay, mathematically. Uh, you have n players uh, choosing a, posi a position in the compact set Q. Uh, we will denote by P the Q the set of borrowed probability measures. And the idea is to minimize a distance from some place. In the concert example is the stage. In the demonstration is uh, the monument. Uh, players are congestion averse. Then you have a component in the cost which uh, choose the aversion to be cr close to the other people. Then the cost of the player in a simple context uh, can be modeled by a function of i, which depends on his own strategy and the strategy of other players. And it's given by a function which tries to be close to the place p with some parameter alpha, a positive, and uh, some parameter beta, which with the mean, let's say, with the distance to the others. Okay. Then uh, this uh, structure, you can plug it uh, in an integral by using direct masses. And you can see that uh, this uh, function, which has these two components, can be written like uh, this uh, the expression. And this expression has a particularity that uh, all, the, all the functions of all players are the same. You have only to interchange the position that you are looking for with respect to the others. And you have exactly the same, uh, the same uh, function, the same objective function. So like uh, an, a potential game. Okay, uh, then we suppose uh, that we have a Nash equilibrium. What is a Nash equilibrium? Uh, here, I, in, in pure strategies, usually you don't have a Nash equilibrium, but in, in mixed strategies you have. But we, we will suppose that here you have a, a point, the Nash equilibrium is a point in which uh, the position chosen by the people cannot be better than any other position for a fixed, uh, for a fixed position chosen for action chosen by everyone, no one is interested to deviate or to choose another position. Everyone is happy given that, um, that equilibrium. That's uh, the concept of an equilibrium, but uh, for sure that could be very several equilibriums, but each one has this property. Then the idea is to see what happens when n tends to infinity. And uh, well, um, because of compactness of the space, you have uh, convergence uh, to, of uh, the cesaromine of the Dirac the, the to a particular density, density in, uh, in, a, in a borel measure. And this equilibrium, M bar, we will call it, uh, satisfies a fixed point equation. And this, uh, this fixed point equation says that the, this uh, limit behavior uh, assigns probability, positive probability, only to the points which minimizes this function with respect to the first variable. <laughs> so, uh, minimize the first variable with respect to the current density. Then it's a fixed point equation. You assign a positive probability and the support of the measure where you assign some probability are only the points who, in which uh, this is minimized with respect to x phase to the same density. Okay, that's the, the property that the limit uh, density has. Okay, then um, you can change from the static case that's everything static, there's no time, then, then you can think 
about the limit behavior when the people in the demonstration already arrived to the to Plaza Italia or in the concert where they already choose this position. But you can think about the game in which the people start with a with an initial probability measure and they then they move to find their position around time, about in time. Then that's a differential game with n players where, in which each player i minimizes again the same aversion, let's say, with two others and uh, want to be close to a place, let's say. And a final cost, because they're interested that uh, up to time t, an horizon t, they arrive at a good place, let's say. And also here you, you can add a, a kinetic energy, let's say, of the, of the players for uh, arriving to the best place. Then you have that for a starting point. And again, you have a similar, uh, similar results. This, this part is somewhat technical, but it's just a motivation. Uh, then you have a Nash equilibrium, uh, uh, when, and you have a convergence of Cesar mean of the initial point. Of, let's say that the initial points of each one can be represented by a density, M0. Then uh, you have also convergence for each T of the density to a density in PQ. And this density satisfies a, a couple system of equations. Uh, the first one, a Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation, uh, in which uh, represents the, 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 the value function of the system, uh, which is backward in time. Here you have the final state and you move to the backward in time. And the other is a continuity equation uh, of, of called Mogarov Fokker plan, uh, in which which uh, models starting from N0, how the density moves uh, around time, yeah, given for this drift uh, now value. Okay, then here you can see that this one depends on U and this one depends on M here, and it's a coupled system. And you have a modification in which if you add some uh, um, stochasticity to this uh, differential game, you, you, if you add some Brownian motion here uh, you end up with a similar system, but in which you have some diffusion in both equations. Okay, then that's the that's the classical setting of midfield games, which are dynamic. You are looking for trajectories, or in this case, uh, in the in the limit case, you have density moving uh, around time. The ergodic counterpart, let's say, when you want to see the stationary version, uh, and don't, the, the long time be, uh, behavior of average solutions, that's a technical name, you arrive to this uh, couple system of partial differential equations, but we, in which the time is not involved, it's just in space, because we are looking for that kind of limit uh, density and limit uh, solution. You. And you have some constraints arriving. In particular, I point out that this one is one which is complicated somehow. The, the m bigger than equal to zero, because we will discuss a little bit about Newton's method in this context. And uh, this is the setting in which we will focus. It's a stationary version, even if we have some results in, in the, the dynamic one. But I will focus this talk on the stationary mean field game. Okay. Uh, and then we. Uh, stay in stationary midfield game, but all, another reduction <laughs> for simplifying the talk is that we will focus on local couplings. Uh, we are now working some in uh, uh, some works in um, in non-local couplings, but uh, we will see what the advantages of non-local coupling in the numerical point of view. Mm -hmm. non local couplings uh, uh, just say that your function in which you are uh, you are seeing the others so you are seeing very local. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just in the point. You're interested that your 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 payment depends on the, the density in that point and not in the density in in, in other places. Okay. Then it's a limit behavior if you are uh, let's say it's a limit behavior when your your site is reduced. Let's say. Then uh, well we set also for simplicity again uh, that the compact set to be the torus. Uh, this reduction allows you to forget about the boundary conditions in uh, a new man. You can also, but I never did, <laughs> don't, uh, being frankly. Uh, but you can also to have a new man boundary conditions or difficult boundary conditions. But in this case, by using the torus, you forget about that. And we will set new about the diffusion parameter here. Then uh, this talk uh, aims at studying numerical methods for solving uh, that uh, stationary problem. 
uh, stationary and with local copies. Okay. Uh, feel free to uh, ask anything if you have any question. Well, in 2010, Ashdu and Caboso Cheta proposed a um, um, discrete version of the system. And the discrete version, it's, it, it has shown in two papers that this system is close enough, or converges to a solution uh, when the step, uh, uh, the, the grid step or the mesh step uh, is close to zero. Then um, we focus on this uh, on this scheme uh, because of that, because uh, you have already the theoretical uh, support that this discrete uh, system is, uh, so the solution of this discrete system is close enough to the continuous solution. Then we start with that and we, and we try from here to uh, have the optimization problem. That's the, the main thing here. And in this particular discrete system, which is close to the solution and the continuous solution, uh, you can see that uh, you, you can recover the, the same uh, elements of the, of the continuous system, but in their discrete uh, versions. Uh, the, the divergence here, uh, this is the classical divergence, there's nothing weird about that. The, the only part which is a little bit different is so the, the, the Laplacian, let's say, sorry. Uh, the, the, only, the only thing which is different is actually the divergence at the gradient, hmm? because uh, the gradient and the divergence uh, have four components. And here you have somehow, because we are working in two dimensions in the torus of dimension two, you have four directions to see. And in each one, you, can, you have a kind of um, upwind uh, um, scheme in, 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 numerical, uh, in numerical, numerical analysis. And a, and a kind of upwind scheme that somehow helps to this stability of the system. I am not expert in, uh, in, in, in that uh, field, but that's it's a particular thing of this discrete system that uh, in which we know that the, this, the solutions of the discrete system are close enough to the um, continuous system. Okay, then that's a thing I, I would remark and we will focus on that. And also an important thing here in red is uh, you have the positivity constraint which uh, helps to the next slide because this positive concept uh, somehow um, have problems in the Newton's method. Yeah, I will start with this first point in which the performance method depends on the value of, uh, of nu. When nu is big, uh, actually the, the, the diffusion helps you to have positive densities. And, but when the nu is, uh, is small, uh, you can have some parts in which the, the density is zero. And in those parts, Newton method uh, can gives you after one iteration uh, some negative values. And if you have negative values, you have uh, issues uh, for, for continuing. Then there are several uh, papers here that use uh, Newton methods. For example, this one in 2010, uh, for Ashdu, Camille, and Kakache, uh, and all of them say that Newton's method has some issues when the, the, the density is small. Hmm? Also, Newton's method has the problem that you need to have a initial guess close enough to the solution. But uh, beyond that, the main problem is that uh, the positivity constraint part. OK, uh, I already talked about that, that you have convergence of the discrete setting to uh, continuous, so the discrete solution to the continuous solution. The convergence is uh, in, in, in the, with the, is uniformly and in L2 for powerful Hamiltonians. Here we have Hamiltonian, which is quadratic uh, for simplicity. Too. OK, uh, there is a variational approach. And that's the, the part in which we, uh, we, we have the mean field game and we put it in the optimization context, is that uh, actually the system, you can see it as a first order optimality conditions of an optimization problem. And that's the main thing. An optimization problem which with uh, linear and affine constraints, OK? And actually, you can derive that the Lagrange multipliers associated to these constraints are, are the u, uh, the, the value function that you have in the, in the system, and the lambda that appears here. OK, and this, uh, this optimization problem has a, here you don't see the u and the v, because here there is a kind of change of variable in which this w takes that, this uh, part. And this is a, it's a change of variable proposed by Benemu and Benemia in the 2000. And uh, actually, that allows you to have a linear, uh, a linear constraint here. 
And there you have a convex function, even if the, then it does, doesn't like in the first sight that it's a convex function, it's a perspective function uh, in which we can compute the efficiently the approximate operator that I will introduce in some slides. Then actually that's a nice optimization problem. It's non-smooth, as you can see, you have the infinity here and uh, uh, your constraints. Uh, it's very funny the, the, the form of this uh, function because in zero it's zero, but just uh, after it's plus infinity then, but it's anyway, lower semi-continuous, convex and proper. And here you have your functions, it's just the integral, you know, the, the, the primitive of the, your f and you plug it here. And you you obtain that the by the optimal conditions are the solution that you are looking for. Then uh, this is the what what are the goal of this talk is to provide a variational formulation of the discrete uh, setting of H2, because this one we know that it is close to the solution. Then we will provide a variational formulation uh, optimization problem we will call pH. Uh, in order to, for this problem, to deal with numerical approximations via classical techniques in optimization. That's uh, the idea. That's uh, the part. The, the second part is to review the proximal splitting algorithms, starting from gradient and prox, for seeing how to deal with this particular structure, convex, non-smooth convex function the top, uh, constraints which are affine linear. And uh, here we have some papers in which, well, uh, there are, for instance, here, Filippo and uh, Benamou Carlier, they have some results with uh, el finite element discretization of some dynamics in the case in which there's no viscosity. And uh, we compare at the end a little bit with uh, the aumental Lagrangian scheme that they do. They do. Uh, so, so they have some paper of a treat of 2017, but he do with some preconditioners. Again, it's another discretization. The, the problem of finite element and the other discretization, you don't know how, how near from the solution is because you don't have the result of H2 in 2010. That's the main difference. And there's another paper I, will, I would like to talk about. It's about uh, the paper of Papadakis, Peireude. It's in other settings of optimal transport, you don't have the F. But, and they do it in without viscosity again in central grid, then our results is a little bit far from there because of the inclusion of the F and the inclusion of the viscosity mainly. Okay, then we will review the splitting methods and we will connect the splitting methods with fixed point iterations. That's the way in which I will I would like to introduce those methods. We will propose, given the structure of the method, you have some constraints, we will propose a projected version of primal dual splittings and some numerical experiments uh, at the end in the context of midfield games for, for sure. Okay, that's uh, the idea. Then we start with uh, the problem, splitting algorithms. We have two approaches I will discuss at the end of two and we end with uh, numerical experiences. Okay, that's the discrete optimization problem just uh, in one slide. It's very, very similar. If you look this one, it's very, very similar to this one. You all have only to change the Laplacian for the, the Laplacian version, the divergence of the same divergence of H2. Here you have the, your density constraint. The only thing which is different and we have some work to find is that actually the, here the function, the, the perspective function, you have an additional a cone constraint. You have an, kind of a, an indicator function of a cone in which the cone is this one. And this cone comes from uh, the upwind discretization that I, I told you in the beginning that the, the discretization of H2 that he proposed and he showed that is close enough to the solution has in the, for the gradient some uh, upwind um, scheme. And from there you have positive and negative parts. And those one in the optimal conditions for achieving that system, we need to include that cone uh, by for each uh, node. Mm? You have your grid and for each node you do that. Other interesting point here is the function. The, your coupling function depends only on uh, on only on the point because of the local uh, assumption. Yeah, you, if you don't have the local coupling, here you should have some sum, some linear operator depending on more ends. But here you are only depending on your the density in that point of the grid 
because of the local assumption, okay? Then that gives you a structure which is very particular. You have the sum of uh, only uh, functions which as uh, uh, a separable function, okay? And we will see that the prox of that is not very difficult to compute, okay? Uh, that's it. Uh, those who are linear operators, you have a linear, linear, uh, linear uh, constraint here, and you have your density constraint. Well, we have a qualification conditions. We prove that you have a strictly feasible point, you have Slater. And then uh, the existence comes from uh, classical results. You have, uh, well, we, we also prove that the problem has a, a minima. Uh, uh, any solution, for any solution, there exists Lagrange multipliers. You have the qualification conditions. You see your, your first, first order uh, optimality conditions. And with the same change of variables, uh, a for gram minus probably, uh, you obtain your discrete system. Then that's the first work to start with the discrete system and to plug it in the optimization context. Okay. Then that's a problem. You have uh, we will assume increasingness of so you have uh, we'll assume that the f uh, the little f is increasing in order to have convexity on the primitive on the antiderivative. And uh, by setting phi to be the sum of this separable function, uh, you plug it here, and that's it's your phi. And uh, denoting uh, the, this as matrices, linear operators A and B, they are finally just matrices, you have that linear constraint given uh, by this matrix uh, xi, okay? Then that's the structure of the problem, okay? And here, uh, that ends this part that we have two ways in which to plot he, uh, this problem. Uh, you can plot it as uh, the same function plus a psi composed with a linear operator. The first is a split and uh, split version. The split version is to see to, to say that this phi is only the indicator function of this point of 0, 1. And the linear operator is just, just psi. And the second version is to say, okay, uh, this one is the whole, the, the whole uh, fine space. And then the L, you can, you can plug it in. And that's a split and split version. And we will see uh, after I introduce the algorithms that the split and split version has very different uh, structures because in one, you, you should project onto the whole the fine space while here you don't, but you have another issues. Then we will talk about uh, that later. Okay. Then now, now we have the structure of the problem, convex function, affine linear constraints. Now, now we, I will introduce um, how to solve that kind of optimization problems. I will start with the basics. Uh, if you minimize some function, assuming you have solutions, uh, a function psi, so phi, which is uh, convex, lower, semi-continuous, and proper, uh, we will call this class of function gamma zero. Uh, how to do how to solve that in a general context? We will start with the basic and more uh, the problem with more structure, the smooth uh, case. If the function phi is smooth and is uh, differentiable, convex differentiable with the Lipschitz gradient, uh, that's uh, your chi will be the constant of Lipschitz. Uh, the optimality conditions say that, uh, well, it's just gradient equals zero, okay? It's a solution if and only if uh, the gradient is zero. Then that's equivalent by multiplying by minus gamma and adding the X uh, to a fixed point to of this gradient operator, okay? And then you can see that uh, your, your optimal condition can be written as a fixed point. The thing is that you have to guarantee that, that the operator of this fixed point, it's good enough. And then that's uh, the question. Because you actually, because once you have a fixed point, you can just iterate the, the, the operator, but the, the operator at least should be non-expansive. If not, you don't arrive anywhere. Then uh, the, the, you, the gradient methods, nothing but to operate this operator, uh, gradient operator. And uh, the question is when uh, this gradient is good enough for achieving convergence. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem with more structure, if you have strong convexity, for instance, and strong convexity is just that if you subtract a quadratic term, you are convex. Uh, and your gamma is not too large, uh, depending on the Lipschitz constant of the gradient, uh, you have actually that uh, this gradient operator is a contraction. 
the contraction uh, constant is uh, given by that. That depends on the step. And because of the balance of the step, you can optimize it. And with that uh, step, you have the smaller r. Mm -hmm. Then if you have a contraction, you have already existence of the solution, uniqueness, and linear convergence. Okay, And th that's the best of the worlds. If uh, you don't have a strong convexity, uh, actually, you will have, uh, because of the Lipschitz uh, uh, condition of the gradient, uh, which is an assumption, uh, under the same uh, um, condition, the step sizes, you have a variety of non-expansivity, which is that kind of on expansivity, it's like uh, if you forget about this term, which is positive, it's just on expansive, but this term helps, uh, helps to achieve the convergence. Mm -hmm. Then it's not as good as in the previous case, in the strongly convex case, but it helps to, to promote the convergence. Okay. And uh, well, here you have a particular contact of average, average on expansivity, and the convergence is not linear, it's just big O or one over K. Okay. There are some variants I will not discuss too much, but there are some variants in which you add some inertia terms and some parameters which move uh, around the iterations, and you can improve your one over k from to one over k square. Okay, that's the work uh, leading by Nestor in the 80s. Then here you can see an, a simple example of uh, the gradient method uh, for a, a parameter 0.2 in which your Lipschitz constant here it's uh, two, then you are able to have a step size up to one because that's uh, the Lipschitz gradient of this quadra simple quadratic function. Uh, and you can see how, uh, well, the, here you are going uh, perpendicular to the level sets. Uh, here is not very, very good the design, but you're doing perpendicularly, arriving to the minimizer, which is a zero here. Here you can see the errors uh, on iterations how the error decreases. Here you have the 3D uh, form, okay? The, the problem of gradient, uh, when you are near from one, you have gamma zero nine nine nine. Uh, actually you're in the, in the limit of convergence. Actually, if you take 1.1, you just diverge. Mm -hmm. But if you're near from 999, you have that, that kind of uh, isolated, uh, oscillating behavior in which you see as it's very slow, yeah? It's, a, it's the same context, just another gamma. And you have to be aware about that. And if you take the optimal step size, you have a much faster convergence for gradient, but you have that issue of uh, the, on the step size. You have to be careful about that, okay? What happened if uh, the function now is non smooth, which is in somehow in our case, we haven't included the, the affine linear constraints, but it's just the objective function. But if it's non smooth and um, approximable, let's say. Uh, if uh, this function is non smooth, you cannot take any gradient, but you can take the subdifferential. In the subdifferential, uh, I just recall for those who, that it's all of the slopes that are uh, near from the non differentiability points. Because in the differentiability points, you have just a gradient. Mm -hmm. and the, on, and the only element here is the gradient, it's a singleton if it's differentiable. If it's not, you, rec you recover all the slopes and you put it in a set which is uh, because it's a set value mapping. Mm -hmm. For instance, here in this, in the absolute value, the differential at zero is the whole interval minus one, one, because of the, all the slopes here. Then optimized conditions are similar to the differential case. Uh, you have a solution if and only if uh, zero belongs, if this one belongs to the subdifferential at the point. Mm -hmm. And it's an if and only if in the convex setting. Again, you can do the same. You can multiply by gamma, add an x, and to see that your x star is a solution if and only if you is a fixed point of the proximity operator, and that's uh, I, I will define it as the identity plus gamma sub differential minus one. But that, that's very tricky. Can, can you invert it? What is that? Uh, but this one is nothing but the optimality condition of a problem. Uh, if that problem because this one is convex, that is strongly convex. Then you have a unique solution. And this unique the solution is defined by the, it's the prox of that x. Then prox of x is nothing but the solution of this problem on y on x, given dates. This proximity operator generalizes the projection. If you take here the indicator function of a convex set, and that is zero in C plus infinity if not, just, just add a constraint here and you're looking for the nearest point from x uh, in, in C. And that's the projection. 
and you have a, a generalization of the projection in that sense for uh, other non-smooth convex functions. Uh, and uh, the same question, then that's a proximal point algorithm. Uh, Martine and Rockefeller uh, the, are, the, are the people that start this uh, idea to compute the procs, but also the resolvent in the monotone case, I will talk a little bit later of that. Uh, and this, uh, you have the same question of the gradient operator. When this operator is it's good enough for achieving convergence, uh, the convergence is always unsure once the, the function is uh, lower semi-continuous convex and proper. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if additionally it's strongly convex, uh, actually this operator is a contraction. And here you can see the contraction constant, which depends on gamma. And the larger gamma, the smaller uh, the, the contraction uh, constant. Then you are you are for, you are motivated to have uh, larger steps in order to uh, solve uh, to use the prox. In general, uh, if you don't have a strong convexity, it's average non expansive again as the gradient uh, with that constant one half. Again, you have that kind of convergence. You cannot uh, expect to be linear convergent, and you also have uh, from Guller some uh, ways to choose the gamma case in order to yield a little bit better convergence rate. Don't, well, then it seems here you don't have any uh, important thing here. You don't have any uh, constraint on the step size. Actually, the larger, the better. And here you have a prox iteration with gamma equals 1. Uh, here's the prox. As you can see now, in that's this context because of the function of phi, you have a, a very explicit and simple form of the prox. And you have a very uh, quick convergence to the to the solution to zero, okay. But if you take uh, gamma equal one hundred, actually, when, with one iteration, you are already here, okay. Actually, you have a that's no surprise because you have a theoretical result which says when gamma turns to infinity, you achieve a minimizer. Then, then it's not a surprise. But you are uh, motivated to do procs with a big step size if you can. And then, then you will minimize your function phi in, the, in this context. Okay, our case. Uh, in our case, we have that kind of uh, problem. You have the sum of two functions, and this is a composition of, of this one. Then there is a Lagrangian approach in which, in order to solve that, because of the complexity of that, you will not uh, have a prox of all that because it's very complicated, probably as difficult as the original problem then you try to split the influences of both uh, terms. And for that, uh, and, and the, one of the first approaches to solve that problem is to see, OK, I will put a variable here, y, and you put a constraint. You take the Lagrangian, you add a quadratic term for having more properties of the Lagrangian, and you try to mini minimize alternating, minimize, maximize this augmented Lagrangian. And that's the uh, ADMM uh, algorithm. You minimize with respect to the first variable alternatingly. The solution, you plug it here and you minimize with the second variable. And uh, finally, you have an update on the multiplier. And this one, this part is not complicated. It's just a prox as before. But this part is more tricky. That depends on phi. There are some cases, for instance, if phi is quadratic, you have just inverse matrix. But if not, the, this part and this part together makes difficult this step size. And, and then in general, you, you will need the compute of sub iterations if the phi is more complicated. And for sure, in the Mifel Kane context, I remember that you have to invert a matrix simply because the phi, phi was quadratic. Um, for solving that, there is another method which is proposed by Chain Table in 94. Which is also Lagrangian, Lagrangian based, uh, based. They add another uh, another step in order to split that. I, I will not put it here, but they they, they arrive. Uh, they they can split this influence and they do it explicitly. Then that's an important thing given by Chan Tuk. There is another approach to to to, to deal with that uh, thing, and it, it this approach lies on the fenchel rockefeller duality. Uh, in this uh, context, uh, you have your primal problem, that's the fenchel rockefeller dual, in which here the stars are the Fenchel conjugate of a function that I define here. And the advantage of the Fenchel conjugate is actually that if you have a gamma zero function, the conjugate is gamma zero, and, and, that, that's, uh, and you can go forward and backwards, <laughs> let's say. And also that the subdifferential of a Fenchel conjugate is the inverse of the subdifferential. 
then with with these two properties actually you can uh, you can say that if you have a solution of the problem that's the just uh, optimality conditions as i said before this is of differential of the sum uh, if you are of qualification conditions you can split the sub differential and split also the linear operator and uh, with that in order to have zero in uh, some sets you can choose here and u and then you have uh, this one and uh, you here. Here you can invert this one and you, uh, you can see how appears the subdifferential of the differential conjugate. And finally, you can plug the LX to the other side and you can see in a primal dual space, uh, optimality condition, primal dual optimality condition. It's a contactor points, let's say, uh, some people call it standard solution set. Uh, There's some, some names for that. Uh, but actually, uh, this uh, primal dual optimality conditions involves something which is subdifferential because it's separable. This uh, this one depends on x. This one on u. You have a subdifferential here, and uh, that's a coupling term which uh, involves the linear operators. This one is uh, um, is uh, skew skew linear uh, bounded and continuous for sure. And the thing is that. Uh, now this optimality conditions gives you this operator that it's a uh, differential you can do procs there no problem but this one is not a gradient that's the main thing it's not a gradient because it's q uh, you, you should have something something symmetric if you want a gradient uh, but it's not uh, but it's maximally monotone because it's monotone actually that's monotonicity uh, here because of the structure actually that is zero but uh, it, it is satisfied and it's continuous, then it's a maximally monotone operator. The maximum operator, uh, it's a, a little bit bigger. I will not enter into those details, but you have monotonicity and continuity is enough for maximally monotonicity. And for those kind of operators, you can also do resolvent and not gradient because it's not a gradient, then I call it explicit operator, let's say. Okay, that's the same idea, identity minus gamma. And the resolvent is the same idea of the prox, but with a um, monotone operator. Okay. Then uh, a first idea that we did with uh, Patrick in, our, in, my, in my thesis is, was to uh, combine the resolvent with that kind of explicit, explicit operator, and that gives rise to this method. We also have some constraint of the on, on the step sizes, and here you can see how the prox appears of, of the M and the, the gradients. You have a, to add an additional step, uh, gradients or uh, explicit step in order to achieve convergence because of a work of Tseng in 2000. Again, under strong convexity, you have linear convergence. Another approach is to say, okay, but if we take the whole, the sum of the two operators, it's again monotone. Uh, this one was already maximal monotone. This was continuous, defined everywhere. You have also a maximally monotone operator here. Why we just don't do a, a resolvent, which behaves very well, as we can see in the optimization context. Uh, the thing is that here, the, the resolvent is not, it's not explicit. You have, a, you have a coupled system, and you cannot isolate one variable with respect to the other. But that becomes tricky. But you can try to uh, modify the metric in order to have an explicit computation. Uh, if you take a definite positive matrix in the primal dual space, and this, uh, this is the change, event, uh, the, the change of the metric with this uh, u, actually the u minus 1a will be monotone under this metric. Under this metric changes uh, because of a simple computation. The monotonicity is preserved when you change that metric and you take the u minus one a. For a specific choice of u minus one, you take the uh, method of uh, Chambol and Pock in 2011, Antonin uh, see this here. And uh, they uh, actually uh, provide the convergence of this method when uh, those parameters satisfies uh, this uh, constraint. Here uh, in, this in, in this paper, you, you can see that they choose two parameters in order to have more flexibility and they have to satisfy that in order to have convergence. And in the same paper, you, you also prove the strong convex, the linear convergence when both are strongly convex, the phi and the psi star. And if one of them are strongly convex, you achieve a better convergence rate, uh, but uh, not, not linear. No? You have that kind of uh, inequality with square is square there. 
Okay, that finishes the, the, the review and I have not much time, but I will just said that this problem uh, set like that, I re recall that we have the split and unsplit versions. All the methods before that I show you have the implement of the dual variable like that. With a, here the X can change, but actually it's always a prox of psi star UN. And because of the psi, which is an indicator function, uh, it's, uh, in this case, it's just uh, uh, in the split decomposition, it's just to subtract that. Then all the methods, the only way in which they, they impose the constraint is via the Lagrange multiplier updates. What's the problem of that? Is that the primal dual, the primal iterates are not feasible. If you stop any, in any place the algorithm, your, your x's are not feasible at all. Okay, and then, and also we saw in, in our particular problem that those methods splitting the, the matrix were very, very slow. And uh, that was a problem for us because I, I, had, I had many hope that the, the, that splitting methods were fast, but by splitting, actually we have problems. The unsplit version, uh, which is take uh, now the identity and this operator, need the computation of the inversion of a Laplacian. Then it's uh, more complicated in the IDP context, it's a complicated uh, computation. But in the stationary case, any, any, anywhere, any, anyway, it's fast, then uh, it's enough. But if you have also the time involved, it can be tricky. And that, that's the problem of that. But with the unsplit version, you can have some iterates which satisfies the whole constraint. Because if you project, you have an, some iterates which are actually satisfying all the constraints. And that's uh, the good point. The bad point is that you have the invert that matrix. And uh, uh, depending on the new, if the new is very small, you can have uh, problems with the condition of the matrix and that can be tricky. Then the proposal that we had uh, with, some, with those people here uh, was to add a projection. Uh, actually, at least you, in our context, the, the mean field gain context, we would like to uh, ensure that the primary iterates are at least densities. Then we add a projection on the density, mm, but uh, with other uh, people, uh, Julio Herida and Christian Vega, we afterwards, we didn't apply to mean field games, but we afterwards change uh, which is the line. You can change it alternatingly, randomly, and also works. Uh, and that's what I, I would like to say. But this is a projected chamber focus, <laughs> it's a name, projected primal dual in a monotone context. And under the same uh, conditions, you have convergence. To a point in C, then at least those points are in the in the set you choose. Okay, that's uh, in our case will be the density constant, and uh, that's it. Then you know the methods for sure. There's a prox computation, and the prox, as you can see, in our case was separable. Then and for each one of those, it's just uh, amounts to solve a, a cubic equation in P. Here you have the cone, which uh, was a new thing. And, uh, and it's uh, fast to solve because of the separability and uh, because of the structure. And this prox extends some work in Papadakis in which the K was not an issue because they use another discretization, not the discretization of a do. And also you, we include the F also because there was an, an optimal transport and the F doesn't appear. In our case, it appears and we plug it inside. It's a contribution there. Then the algorithm that the classical chamber block, which was very slow because of the issues I told you before. And uh, actually we saw that the form of the density was already from the first iteration you, are, you achieve it, but the density constraint wasn't. And then that's where the inspiration to add that projection. And that projection is not costly at all. It's just to add that and uh, it's much faster. Then we test it in an example in which we know the solution. The solution is explicit. Here's a first order problem in which you don't have any density. You have don't, don't have sorry, you don't have sorry don't have any diffusion term, and uh, the, so the, this is the exact match. Then you you can compute actually the L2 error, the exact L2 error of the iterations. Mm -hmm. And we plug here. We didn't put the unprojected version because the without any projection was very slow. All these, those methods are the methods presented, the blue, the red, and the uh, yellow one was uh, present. Uh, we add a projection onto the mass constraint uh, because the others are uh, around here. They even doesn't appear. Uh, and those ones are not too bad, I should say, <laughs> but the, those ones we won was the unsplit version. 
Uh, that's it's because, as I said, in the stationary version, the matrix to be inverted is not that difficult. Backslash still works in MATLAB. Everything here is done in MATLAB anyway. Uh, of course, you can improve that. But uh, the matrix is not very difficult to invert. No? Then you can see, of course, uh, more degrees of freedom, the less uh, add to error. Uh, but uh, again, the, the best solutions at each time uh, was the chamber poke unsplit mm -hmm. with, with just the identity. Mm -hmm. uh, here, the same, but here you have the CPU time with respect to, uh, to degrees of freedom. And you see that constantly the same, uh, uh, the same, um, uh, blue, the same chamber poke unsplit was the winner. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the second test is the comparison with ADMM in order to compare with uh, Benamou Karalie. And actually, they, uh, we did the ADMM uh, with density, uh, density from zero, and uh, after, after that, for the other densities. And we can see that the ADMM is this one. It compares with the same here, which is the, uh, the, this one. And uh, well, for that's small for small viscosities. Actually, in the paper we saw that for bigger viscosities, a DMM which wins. Huh? Then I, I, I want to be fair here. For small viscosities, uh, the chamber pole wins, but but with big viscosities, we we, we didn't win. Hmm? And then that's uh, in some tests for in, in also in uh, in the Mifelke context. Okay. Then for for finishing, uh, we also have done uh, different uh, powers of Hamiltonian. We have. Uh, uh, not only the power, the quadratic Hamiltonian, and we have a two additional tests. We also the prox you can compute it even if you include hard constraints. That is, uh, that is, for instance, in some places I don't want to be no one. Then you put zero there, or in these places you uh, they will not the pass uh, one half, for instance. And you can add that kind of uh, hard constraints, and the prox can be computed explicitly. And we have some uh, some results there. We also vary this thing, uh, this power Hamiltonian, and we have some different results how the density moves. And uh, in other paper, with other people, we also work in the dynamical case. And on, uh, then we we, we we like to see where where are the trajectories of the people. In preparation, more general Hamiltonians, not only powers, uh, congestion. How to add the congestion to that? Uh, we're working on. Well, several years <laughs> up to now, and uh, non-local coupings we are uh, very interested in right now, and also in the numerical term, uh, how to for these kinds of problems, how to uh, avoid pro projections and other ways in which you can have uh, efficient uh, implementations. That's uh, we are working on now. Then it's that's it. Uh, in the red, you have the main uh, contributions. This one is the algorithm with the projection. And here you have all the results in midfield games and stationary, stationary midfield games and dynamic case. Mm -hmm. The others on the papers we have seen, we finish with the authors who started the, the midfield game theory. And uh, thank you. Merci de votre attention. Merci pour l'invitation encore.